Welcome back to another episode of the SDI Killer Evo 6 presented by Coyorad. Today we're finally going to start this thing up and Pete's going to explain why he's changing up the wheels. All right, everybody. First of all, let me say it's good to be back and standing next to the Evo with Peter a safe six feet away from me and be resuming our, uh, our teamwork on this car. Even though it's Peter's car and he's going to try to beat the STI, I'm still excited to see it again because that motor, well, I mean, we both put a lot of love and effort into it and it's we're finally a team, time. We're a team at the shop we are. and we're frenemies we're on the racetrack. Adversaries at the racetrack. That's right. Let's go with that theory. In any case, I'm excited to get this thing ready to start up and that means priming it. Really what we should have done is primed the oil pump during engine assembly, but because we didn't disassemble the oil pump and therefore have access to it internally to prime it, we are gonna prime it, prime it now using uh, what you might call a bit of a ghetto technique. This tip comes to us from an anonymous source located in New Zealand, whose initials may or may not have an A and an S in them. In any case, we are gonna force some air down through the dipstick tube into the sump, and that apparently will help force air into the oil pump. There's a few other steps we have to do before we do that, but we're gonna show you that whole procedure. And then we're gonna cross our fingers and hope that that does prime the pump well enough that it has oil pressure on startup. I guess the other option we might have available to us is to go to NV Auto and borrow their like really highfalutin oil pressurization system that we used on the STI motor. But I, frankly, I think I'm kind of curious to test out this, uh, this more uh, accessible, dare I say, ghetto way of doing it. So I think we're gonna try that first. And then we have a bunch of setup work to do with the link. It's just frankly above our pay grade. Neither of us are really ECU experts here. So we are gonna have Jason from Link ECU join us again. He joined us on the M3 and he's gonna join us again here to get everything configured and to allow us to read oil pressure before we actually start, try to start this because we really wanna be able to see if we're getting good oil pressure or not. So for a break in oil, we are going with Valvoline's conventional 5W30. This is just a, it's a classique as it says on the bottle. It's not a synthetic. This is their like, you know, most affordable basic oil. And as I'm sure you guys know, typically you do not want to break in a brand new engine on a synthetic. You want to break it in on a mineral based oil like this or a actual break in oil. There are some like fancy break in oils out there, but Andre at HP Academy said, don't sweat it. Just use some basic mineral oil, break it in on that. And, uh, switch out to synthetic after about uh, 500 kilometers of uh, break-in usage. So we'll, uh, we'll do an initial flush with this stuff and then we'll probably do a drain before we go to the dyno just to get any you know, little bits out of the, the engine build and out of the whole, in, you know, the whole system. And then we'll probably tune on the dyno on this stuff and then go to a synthetic after that. So I should also mention that this has their easy pour bottle even though it's the affordable stuff. So even I can pour it left-handed. Wow. Look at that everybody. Not going to put a lot in because we've already put five liters in and this takes I think 5.1 we've upgraded the oil cooler so maybe five and a half liters I think we're yeah I'll give it another splash but I think we're pretty close and then we can move on to priming this thing actually before we move on to pressurizing the oil system I realized or actually Pete realized we need to put the rest of the fluids in this thing first so we're going to start by filling it up with some coolant for that, we are using this Xerox by Valvoline. This is their Asian vehicle blend. And of course, we are using this funnel that uh, creates a high point in the coolant system. So all the air should want to rise to that, hair, that, to that high point and burp out here. So we'll put a link in the description to this funnel, which I think Pete got on Amazon. So we just had a quick phone call with Jason from Link ECU, and uh, he's gone through the software with us to uh, configure some of the sensors and just make sure everything is ready for uh, our initial our startup basically and uh, we actually had to go through it a little bit and check some wiring and make sure our sensors were all functioning properly we even had to like calibrate a sensor or two because we're using some AEM sensors that have you know their own their own like highs and lows that we need the, the ECO to know about so we've gone through and done that on our own because uh, Jason had to go do other things so we just used the help menu and figured it out on our own which you know we're, we're noobs with this stuff we, we started to learn a little bit about PC link on my Celica and then a little bit more on the M3 and uh, we're really getting dragged in here which is great because this is really important stuff in this day and age to know how to you know interface with your ECU and I gotta say the software is excellent it's really easy to use and the help menu is actually helpful so felt good felt powerful to be able to calibrate a sensor and actually get things set up and I should also mention that we've also uh, properly calibrated our AEM dash so if I jump over to the AEM dash design 2 software this is their latest version of their dash design software. They've made a lot of upgrades to it. 
And it too, I think, has come a long way as far as user friendliness goes. It's, it's become very intuitive. I struggled a little bit with it initially, but I think now it's really very easy to figure out. And we were able to, for example, replace one of these readings down here in the bottom right corner to, uh, from a, a lambda reading to an oil pressure reading, because for initial startup, it's obviously very important to know your oil pressure. So we've got that on there now. We've also you know, made sure our, our map sensor and all that is calibrated, our coolant temp is calibrated. So we are good to go, I think, for priming this thing. Exciting moment here. We are gonna prime this engine now. And as Dave explained, what we're gonna do is take some pressurized air and force it down the dip dipstick tube while we're cranking the engine. And that's just gonna give the oil just a little bit of oomph to start transferring and, and getting its way through the entire engine. Uh, we have pulled the spark plugs. The injectors are off, so there's uh, no chance this is gonna start. The reason why you pull the spark plugs is you just don't want extra load on the bearings. So it makes sense, it just makes for a, an easier stroke. So, DP, you ready? I'm ready. He's gonna be watching the oil pressure gauge and it's gonna, it may take 30 to 60 seconds actually for, for us to see oil pressure. So, all right, go ahead. Okay. You watch the red number here, that's our oil pressure. Slowly climbing, Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So our pressure is climbing nicely. Our battery is getting tired. Battery is going dead on the starter, but we got up to uh, 16 PSI of oil pressure there. So that's a good sign. And if the battery was fresher, I'm sure we could keep forcing it up more, but that's maybe enough for uh, priming, Pete. What do I you think? I think so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we're good. Okay, well, then uh, next step, start up. Well, Peter, I've got goosebumps all of a sudden because it's time to fire this thing up. And, oh, uh, man. It's a little nerve-wracking. I mean, the motor sounded good when we were cranking it for priming, so the plan here, by the way, after having watched HB Academy's uh, initial startup video, the plan is to run it for 30 to 60 seconds to make sure we've got good oil pressure, to check for leaks, and to make sure it's not making any weird noises and everything's good, then we'll shut it off after that 30 to 60 seconds of initial startup. And then we'll go into a proper like break-in cycle for the engine. So we're not bringing this up to temperature or anything. This is just a check. Will it fire? Will it leak? Will it have oil pressure? And will it knock or make any crazy me metallic noises? No, no to any of those. Hopefully we're good on all that. Except for oil pressure. <laughs> and then we can talk more about the break-in process. All right. All right. You ready? Okay, I'm, I'm nervous. Let's do this. Here we go. <laughs> wow, that came up fast, man! Wow! It's running, DP! It's running! I don't see any. I don't see any leak. How's the oil pressure looking? Oil pressure is reading really high. It's like over a hundred, but yeah, on that's a cold normal. motor, that's normal. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. We got a little bit of smoke out the tailpipe, which is normal. It's gonna clear up, but it's running, guys. I'm yes. five you, but we're not allowed to right now. We've got yeah, to stay six feet apart. It's All right. Away, high five. It's, it's running good. We can shut it off. Let's shut her down. Woo! <laughs> Dude! Look at that. Yes, yes, and there are no leaks. We built a motor and it didn't clank, it didn't fall apart. No, I think the, uh, the power no, steering's right. a little whiny, but we just probably air it in. Yeah, exactly. Man, oh, that's man. exciting. That is really Did you exciting. See that thing just fired One right up. I think our priming actually primed it to start. So wow, things are going well here, everybody. Let's uh, let's move on. Yeah, and a you know what? Big thanks to Jason at oh, Link. Yeah, Holy smokes, he just helped us dial in everything, like the injectors and all that stuff. Gave us a crash course on that Link yeah. software. Yeah, and big thanks to HP Academy too. I mean, what a value it is to have their guidance through this whole process. So we'll put that discount code in the description again, where you can go get seventy-five dollars off of any of their courses, including this engine building course, which includes a module on startup and one on break-in too. Pete and I have just reviewed HP Academy's engine break-in video. It is the last video in their practical engine building series. Actually, I actually think there's one more, a conclusions video, which I haven't watched, which I assume Andre just concludes that you've now built an engine, congratulations. And we have in fact done that. And this engine break-in video is full of great information. It's eight minutes of goodness. And he really explains what you're trying to accomplish when breaking in or, or bedding in a motor. And that is 
uh, you want to encourage piss and ring seal. So you're not trying to break in the bearings. There's no break in with bearings. Bearings should never touch metal. They're always protected by a film of oil. So there's no break in with bearings. It's just primarily it's the piss and rings that you're trying to bed in to those freshly honed cylinder walls. And to do that, to promote proper bed in, you need to put load into the motor. So you never want to let the, 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 the engine idle for a long period of time on a freshly built engine like that because you're not putting enough load to cause the, the rings to be, be pushed out by, uh, by compression pressure and seal with the cylinder walls. And really the rings need to shave off that fresh like high points on the honing and bed in properly. Andre recommends uh, adding load up to like 50% throttle either driving on the street or preferably I think on, the, in, on a dyno in a more controlled environment if you can for like 15 to 30 minutes of adding load at 50% for uh, 20 to 30 seconds, or I think he said 15 to 20 seconds at a time, and then taking load off for a minute to let the rings cool down because you're putting a lot of heat into the rings on this initial hone-in process. So you need to put load in to bed them in, but then you take the load out for a little while to let them cool back down again. You don't want to overheat the rings. So you, you go through that process, you start to add a little bit more load later in the bed and process, and once you've done it for 20 or 30 minutes, you should really have a properly broken in engine or bedded in ring set. So at that point, you can move on to changing the oil, changing the oil filter, and then tuning the engine and, and really treating it like you would any other engine in your, uh, your collection of cars where you can really start to, to, to run it hard. So that's the process we're gonna follow. Uh, and I think before we do any of that though, we're gonna show you what Pete has done with the wheels and tires. When I originally sourced to these Enki GTC O2 wheels, I knew I was gonna be cutting it close for fitment because these are an 18 by nine plus 30. 18s already on an Evo for track use are a bit of a stretch. Going to a 255 is also a very, very aggressive fitment. And sadly, after looking at the rear of this car and seeing just how close these were to the rear arch, and the amount of effort it would take, I would have to like cut that whole rear arch out to make these fit. I have decided to do the thing that uh, most Evo owners would do, and that is go with a 17 inch wheel. So I present to you the newest wheel, and this is a Enki PF05 17 by nine plus 40 offset. So this is going to give me the clearance in the rear. And I've also stepped down on the tire. So this now is a 245 40 17 tire. And I was contemplating, you know, I, I could probably fit that 255, but then I thought, why risk it? At this point, it's already tight in the back. I don't really want to mess with it. I think this is the right way to go so that you're not going to suffer any type of rubbing and we're just going to play it safe. And really, I do love the profile of this five-spoke. It kind of has that uh, WRC era, Tommy Mackinnon five-spoke vibe going with it. It's got plenty of concave too, which I really like. And uh, the weight of this setup is 47 pounds, which ironically is the same as this one. So the GTC 2 is, I think, just slightly lighter and it's a larger uh, wheel. So Enki's certainly done their job with that one. The other thing I should mention is these are half an inch shorter and half an inch narrower than the current setup. So I am gonna be giving up a little bit, but I think we're still gonna be able to beat up on that STI, which is on the 255 size tire. So we'll see, but let's get these bolted on because I'm super excited to see what they look like. The one downside going with a plus 40 offset wheel is we've got huge Brembo's to clear and sadly the PF05's do not clear without a spacer. So what I've done is I've gone out and sourced some ST suspension, seven and a half millimeter spacers and foolishly I've got the wrong ring. So I don't know, my mind's been kind of foggy lately which uh, doesn't excuse it, but I ordered the wrong ring. So usually I'm gonna, I'm, gonna have to I'm gonna have to reorder the right one, but that will fill this gap. So this will fit perfectly centered. And that's the beauty of these ST suspension wheel spacers is that they do have this system that you can pop this inner clip, uh, this inner ring out and fit it to your needs. So let's see with this in here now, let's throw this wheel on and show you what it looks like for clearance. I think we could get away with a five mil, but you know what? 
Uh, up front, there was no problems clearing with the plus or plus 30 on these fenders, which I, I'm pretty sure have had a little bit of a roll done on them. So I figured why not go with a seven and a half just to be safe. There we go. As you can see, we have a good amount of clearance. Oh, lots of, lots of good clearance there, so we're good to go. By the way, I got to thank Turn 14. They were the only place that had these in stock. Even Anki didn't have them. So thank you, Turn 14, for getting me these so quickly. I was kind of in a scramble when I figured out that the rear wasn't going to fit in terms of what wheel to get and where to get it. And they had these in stock ready to go with, of course, great pricing and quick service. So, all right, let's move on to the back. I'll show you what we've got going on back there. Wow, I was not expecting this. We actually have way more clearance than I originally thought. Like this tire will go in there, will, will tuck in without any issue. And this, is st this hasn't even been shaved uh, much at all. So I could probably shave this back even more if I wanted to. However, like I said, on the 18s, we were just out far enough where th it, would, it would have had to, I would have had to like start cutting into here and like taking out a little bit of the back portion of the bumper. So it just wasn't feasible in that sense. I do think we're gonna try to put that seven and a half mil spacer on here to see if we can bring this out a bit because it does feel a little sunk in here. Seven and a half mil spacer is in and we still have good amount of clearance here. I think it's just the combination of the tire being shorter and narrower, this whole setup that allows us to fit. Now I kind of understand why so many Evo owners run a 17 by nine and kind of shy away from the 18s for you know aggressive track use so i think the next step here is to bolt all four corners on and let's have a look at this but before i do that some of you were wondering what lug nuts i'm using and these are the project kicks leg dura closed ended lug nuts and i really like them they they kind of have that somewhat oem look to them with a nice black finish so let's get these bolted on and let's do the reveal here. So, what do you guys think? I personally dig the look. It's more, uh, I don't know, period correct. It, uh, it the, the, like the size is just kind of playing things with my mind because the 18s were kind of like big and bulky and really filled out the uh, the fenders. But now you kind of have this look of, uh, I think, a, a fatter tire. It gives it, I don't know, like a little bit more aggression. I think. I, I certainly love the concave of this. I, I do like how simple and clean it is. I'm not 100% sold on the color. Um, originally, I thought these were gonna be like a really dark gunmetal. Maybe it's just the lighting in here. It doesn't come off as, as super dark in that sense. They do offer them in other colors. I really wanted, they had like a, a special order blue, which I really wanted, but they just didn't have stock on, on that one. And I didn't wanna go with the gold because it's just too rally-ish. Maybe white would have looked cool. I don't know if they offer them in white, but anyways, uh, I think it'll, it'll, it'll grow on me. The color will certainly grow on me. I just noticed we do have a ton of camber in the rear, not a crazy amount uh, up front. So we still have the, the suspension and what to dial in on this thing. Well, Pete, I gotta say, I think you made the right move there because the car looks like it's sitting lower. This being a half inch shorter wheel and tire package, it does lower the car to what I think is more, it's like natural look, isn't it? And, I do love the sort of bulky five spoke look, though I will say they're very reminiscent of like the Mazda Speed five spoke. And when I stand back, I'm seeing a lot of protege here, everyone. I know you Evo guys might get upset, but if you just stand back at the side here, it's looking very protege to me. So uh, I'm still feeling pretty good about the SDI's chances in this battle, but I guess we'll learn more in the next episode where we are gonna break this thing in on the dyno and then have Sasha from On Point Dyno put a proper tune into it and we'll see what kind of power it's making. And at that point, Maybe I'll start to sweat more, but for now, I'm feeling pretty good about my chances. Uh, make sure to let us know in the comments section how you uh, feel about this aesthetic change, whether we went in the right direction or not, and whether or not he's got a chance against the STI or not. I mean, let's be honest, everyone. 
he's going to have to cross his fingers and toes and pray to the gods of 4G63s or whatever it is you Evo guys do. Now that Pete's abandoned these GTCO2s, which I think are an absolutely beautiful wheel, I wonder how they'd fit on the STI. I'm thinking, you know, they're a half inch narrower, the offset's pretty good. Might be able to run these on that car with no spacer in the front, so uh, maybe that's something you'll see soon.